Okay. Thank you very much for uh, organizing the conference, uh, Ilya and the uh, Vedic Association and International Longevity Alliance. And uh, thank you for uh, introducing me, uh, Alexei. Uh, today, um, uh, I will go a little bit uh, personal because uh, uh, I am not only showing my uh, personal uh, genomic results that uh, some of you saw on my t-shirt, but because also I am uh, presenting a project uh, uh, just DNA seq that is a personalized uh, longevity genomic uh, platform, and uh, uh, so yeah, uh, as uh, Alexei mentioned, uh, I am in uh, several places, including systems biology of uh, aging group. But here I will focus mostly on uh, my uh, open source uh, endeavor, and. Uh, uh, represent uh, our uh, Just DNA Seek uh, project team. Uh, so it uh, started uh, from uh, my personal interest not to be a, a shoemaker without shoes because uh, I am bioinformatician. And uh, of course, I wanted to apply uh, aging research skills and uh, uh, longevity knowledge and bioinformatics to myself. And uh, uh, the easiest way to do this uh, was uh, actually to get some omics data, like uh, DNA sequencing was uh, the easiest thing because it's cheap. It's like um, uh, 300, now actually it's $200 uh, dollars, uh, to sequence uh, yourself with 30x depths uh, with Dante or Nebula. Uh, that's uh, what I did. And it was my uh, just personal investigation in the beginning. So. Uh, it was pretty easy to understand that uh, Dante pipeline was bad. So I uh, made my own open source pipeline. I uh, included the variant, uh, I published it at GitHub. And uh, at some point uh, people started noticing the project and uh, they were also curious about uh, themselves and they started contributing and uh, analyzing their own genomes that they also sequenced. And uh, uh, after I managed to uh, get uh, genome assembly and variant polling, and I started, okay, maybe I uh, can uh, think uh, what uh, pro-longevity SNPs I have, and also look uh, what should I do. And uh, there me and uh, uh, other people who joined, we actually got stuck because uh, uh, making a pipeline is the easiest thing here. And uh, then you have like uh, on uh, this slide, you have a huge number of databases and almost uh, nothing that you can use on longevity and popular longevity databases like uh, longevity maps, they were actually not even designed to be used by people on themselves. They just didn't have fields that you can uh, use to annotate your own genome and uh, get results. Uh, and uh, at some point, uh, uh, we just uh, put it on hold because, uh, um, well, it's a pet project and uh, you have other stuff to do. But uh, what happened next is that there was an opportunity when uh, there was a longevity round at Gitcoin. And uh, my friend uh, Lawrence Ion told me that if you have anything open source, you should apply. It was the day before the deadline and uh, I didn't have time to come up with a name. So I took this project, called it Just DNA Seek. I thought that we could raise maybe two or 3,000 euros to do something more, but uh, we raised actually 70,000 uh, in a stable coin. Uh, so like 70, 70 something thousand uh, dollars. Uh, and uh, from this, we actually decided to go seriously and uh, to do way more than we originally planned. And uh, we started from uh, actually what I should have done uh, in the very beginning, even before uh, applying uh, my pipeline writing knowledge is to look uh, what can be done at all. Like uh, what part of my longevity is actually heritable. And uh, I looked into the literature. So here you see some papers and there are different estimates. 
So for uh, normal people that are not centenarians or their children, uh, you have uh, evaluations of from 10 to 30 uh, percent, 33 percent uh, heritability of uh, longevity. And heritability is usually assessed in two ways. One is uh, with uh, uh, family and twin analysis. And uh, they're like, because twins have same uh, uh, genetics and uh, family have, uh, well, related genetics, but you have more pedigree data you can actually see how they are different uh, in this or that trait uh, and uh, make assumptions. And second way is through genomics. And uh, as you might see in uh, this picture, uh, actually uh, heritability is higher when you look at twins uh, for obvious reasons, uh, because uh, with genomic data, our models are not uh, good enough to uh, describe all uh, uh, heritability, uh, but from twins you actually see uh, this uh, signal. And for uh, extreme longevity, of course, heritability is way higher and there are different views on it. Uh, and uh, the second thing that uh, we started doing, so okay, 20% still can be interesting. So uh, we decided uh, to integrate what we already know in the databases. So we already had a pipeline by the time and uh, here you can actually see uh, the general schema, how it works. So you, uh, you can sequence yourself anywhere you want, just order a kit, uh, put your saliva, send it back to Dante, to Nebula. Then you uh, download uh, your uh, own uh, data as a VCA file or they usually have, at least Dante has pretty bad assembly, so you can reassemble uh, the fastq files that you can also download from them. And uh, then you upload uh, to our platform for the analysis, and we use uh, OAKVAR open source genomic platform uh, to do this. Uh, and uh, you get uh, both uh, reports, and uh, you also get the uh, interface to explore some stuff also manually on uh, yourself. And uh, I can actually, I think it will be better to actually open stuff. So here uh, it's in the browser. Uh, so it's uh, a system that you can uh, uh, either, so we have a test server or you can also deploy it on your laptop. So if you care about your privacy, uh, you can actually just run it yourself. Nobody will see your data. Here, uh, usually you just upload the file, put select modules and have analysis. We don't have genome here, but I will show at least uh, the modules that we have. So uh, overall, not only ours, but overall modules, there are like more than a hundred of them. So uh, you see like uh, quite a lot of them. Uh, stuff that uh, was developed by us is, uh, so by here uh, you can see them. Uh, longevity tech. So it's uh, modules that we developed. Usually you just select longevity two and uh, it uh, include, depends on other modules. So it aggregates result for all uh, longevity modules. And also we want to highlight that uh, because there are different approaches, different labs have different opinions, what is uh, really important for longevity and uh, what is not. So uh, any, and your research actually, uh, in order to make it useful, not only for people, for other researchers to read your papers, but uh, for people to actually apply, uh, want to apply uh, your results to themselves, you can actually make a module, we can help with it. So you can have your own view on longevity from your papers that people can actually see whether they have it or not. And uh, I can say that from engineering standpoint, actually things are pretty different. For example, when uh, we had a, to do a lot of curations and for example, longevity maps that Pedro did, one of the most popular longevity databases, we had to extend pretty much uh, every, every row there with additional data to make it usable for uh, personal uh, annotations. And we had to fix many mistakes and add uh, a lot of uh, new things. 
uh, and uh, we don't have time to wait until it analyzes. So here is example of the report. So this is a report, uh, my personal one. Uh, so what you can see here is that uh, you can uh, see uh, longevity variance. You can see uh, information about uh, uh, your drug susceptibility if you want to take rapamycin or if you want to take metformin. So you have to know how to correct your dosage. So it's drug. And you also have uh, important stuff called major health risks that uh, it's not directly explaining how long will you live, but uh, if you have, but if you want to live longer and uh, you have some, for example, heart risks or other types of risk, it's something that you should probably know. And uh, uh, we have the stops for uh, all types of uh, variants. So for longevity, you actually have um, a section on uh, polygenic risk scores. So usually what you get, uh, you get, uh, uh, from one side, you can explain, uh, you can explore uh, gene variants yourself one by one, uh, but also there are uh, polygenic uh, traits uh, that uh, it's important to have uh, to see how multiple genes uh, combines. And uh, we implemented, uh, let me maybe make it a bit uh, smaller. So you can see it. So for example, this is from one of the papers. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this actually I, I selected, I like it because I am high on it. So here you see uh, like a distribution of people. So usually you work with percentiles and uh, uh, you for each of polygenic risk scores, you actually see uh, how many uh, variants are belong to the score and how many of them uh, are actually found. And depending on how many found, also they can have like their dosage uh, and their effect it can be positive, can be negative. And here I'm actually pretty good, at least on this polygenic risk score, better than like 90% of the people. Uh, we are right now working with a bunch of uh, PRSs. So uh, uh, there are different views and different scores. And also for pretty much uh, any, so for many phenotypes, uh, there are uh, multiple PRSs on, 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 on about different types of risks that we also integrate. So for uh, variants, uh, we have categories. So you can see that, for example, for genes involved in limpid transfer and limpid uh, signaling, uh, you can uh, uh, open the results. And the results you have, uh, uh, the tables that you, by color you see what is bad, what is good. So the, the start the most bad. And uh, uh, I'm heterozygotous. I have uh, APOE2 and APOE4. So on APOE, actually, I am uh, pretty bad, high uh, Alzheimer risks. And, but I also have some positive stuff. So you see like uh, downstairs. And uh, you also have data like everything is clickable. You can see populations your genotype and uh, something I like that uh, on uh, another category about, uh, uh, about IGF-1 signaling uh, and uh, insulin signaling. I have really nice uh, SNPs uh, with uh, uh, FOXO that uh, I personally like. Uh, and uh, we have like multiple, we have NTOR pathways, we have tumor suppression genes, we have uh, uh, many other categories, so you can uh, read, read about it and uh, make your own opinion. Uh, we also have for longevity drugs, we have uh, a bit different table when you can see uh, like uh, the effect, will it be slower? Because depending on uh, cytochromes on transporters, you can metabolize drugs faster or slower. And uh, that's what you should know if you take uh, some uh, drugs that you take like whole life, like geroprotectors, or uh, you have like to take statins and so on. Uh, then uh, we have major risks. So like uh, cancer, coronary artery, cardio risks. And uh, again, you have this type of tables. And uh, you also have uh, for some of them, uh, let me go uh, down. Uh, you also have uh, polygenic risk scores 
that uh, we plan to integrate quite a lot of them uh, in the future. So here you can see here actually is the risks uh, scores, um, the more it's the higher risk. Uh, and uh, coming back uh, to uh, actually, let me go through. Uh, and uh, coming back uh, to our recent developments, because now we started actually, uh, so in terms of um, models, polygenic risk scores are just kind of linear models that are interesting but not super good and uh, we are actually so this is polygenic three scores that we have for example but uh, now we are uh, also trying neural networks so uh, we are using uh, uh, so-called interoperable neural networks for genetics uh, arc gene net uh, architecture uh, that uh, is, uh, here you see the neural network uh, schema, so it's a dense network or uh, that uh, you can see that uh, you get SNPs and then uh, you actually look into genes related with the SNPs and pathways and this approach uh, can, is a little bit explainable because you have some idea what it's doing, but it's a bit biased, unfortunately because uh, you, you select topology of connectivity before, uh, between neurons here uh, based on uh, available data about pathways, about uh, uh, what you know about them in the literature. And of course, uh, uh, you, such approach, it uh, downgrades uh, links that uh, we don't know, but that may exist and uh, it has uh, some bias. And see, you see, we uh, for some of the uh, traits, we actually did here you see comparison for um, coronary artery disease prediction. You see polygenic risk scores, and uh, you see that uh, it's my results. And um, it's I am 13 percentile uh, from uh, PRS model. And uh, on uh, GeneNet, uh, you see uh, its accuracy. And I am negative, and uh, it means that actually we see some concordance because low polygenic risk scores means also that I am negative because the higher it is, the higher the risk at least for this polygenic risk score. And this is some uh, kind of uh, we, we looked into some uh, other categories uh, with this network, and this is the project we are started now. We our proposal to UK Biobank uh, was finally approved. We have a collaboration with uh, Helom. It's a company doing um, uh, blood aging uh, clocks. And uh, uh, so far, uh, uh, what is interesting for us is that um, uh, for the clocks, you have to do like a time series of clocks, like you make some interventions and you take uh, multiple, multiple clocks and uh, like monthly or on a quarter basis. So, uh, and uh, there, of course, methylation is very accurate, but it's expensive. Blood is cheap, but uh, less accurate. And um, the thing is, is that is for genome, you just have to sequence it once. And uh, the major idea is that if you once sequence yourself and you get genes and uh, you continue taking your blood aging clocks and uh, maybe you can use your genetic data to improve accuracy of uh, any type of uh, aging clock, uh, just reapplying it all the time as uh, one of the input feature. And that's what uh, we want to check with UK Biobank. We are only starting, but here you can see the schema that we have uh, an ensemble model, like uh, we have one model genetic model, we have blood aging clock, and then we combine them together uh, in a model that has uh, both blood component and genetic component. And uh, we also did uh, a little bit of uh, training, autoencoder training. And uh, yeah, so this is example what we had in the uh, blood aging clock. And uh, here is the architecture, at least that's what we're experimenting uh, with uh, neural networks. So it's two, actually two models. Uh, left uh, half is an uh, autoencoder that uh, you, because in UK biobank data, you have more parameters than typical person does like when he does uh, a blood test. 
uh, and uh, you had extra data, so you can actually learn uh, the um, interrelations between different health measurements with uh, the blood. And uh, you can make assumptions, for example, that if your bun uh, is not right, maybe something is wrong with your kidneys, and you can get it uh, from this representation. And you have a second model that actually does a prediction where you we, we have some uh, uh, 1D convolutional layers that predicts uh, uh, chronological age, uh, biological age delta, like whether you're older or uh, younger and uh, because we trained out encoder we can make also assumptions uh, on your risks of uh, uh, organ specific uh, diseases and mortality and we want to combine it with genomic data we only started this so it's like draft architecture everything will uh, be changed a lot and uh, yeah so that's what we are doing now and uh, a few words about future plans. So I told about uh, the UK Bell Bank. We also want to improve many aspects in our platform. And uh, what we are searching now is uh, we spend a lot of time uh, implementing it, but now actually we want people to use it. So for the labs, for companies, uh, uh, it would be great if we can collaborate. Maybe you can uh, apply it for your uh, research for your clients, for your data sets. And uh, we also want to build uh, uh, Hack Your Own Genome uh, free online course so people can uh, actually play uh, uh, by, with their own genome or with an example genomes like uh, similar like to this Udemy courses. Uh, and there we also need collaboration for people who can help us to make it. So thank you very much and uh, ready for the questions. So thank you so much for the talk and also for open sourcing the tools. My question is, what's your take on, in addition to the open source tools that more tech savvy users can use, build a website where people just, you know, upload their genome and get the same results. And that might be also an option for you to collect uh, these genomes if people opt in into doing that and then later donate it to the longevity research that you find valuable. But you can actually do it now where we have test server, you can upload it. So it's something that actually is working. It's development quality, but you can actually try it now. 